The Alberta Council of Technology presents feature keynote Jeffrey Betts of IBM Canada, May 15th at 8.11 a.m. Watch live at bestofanalytics.com. Jeff currently leads IBM's chronic disease management and personalized healthcare activities in Canada. He has over 25 years of management and project leadership experience, with 15 of those years with IBM. Before joining IBM, Jeff held various IT management positions in the BC provincial government, focusing on creating, operating, and expanding electronic services for citizens. Jeff has led IBM's life sciences consulting practice in Western Canada, working at the front of the healthcare continuum with biomedical researchers striving to develop a molecular understanding of conditions like prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, and transplant rejection. Jeff has led IBM's life sciences consulting practice in Western Canada, working at the front end of the healthcare continuum with biomedical researchers striving to develop a molecular understanding of conditions like prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease, and transplant rejection. Jeff has also been focused on chronic disease management domain, using information technology to help physicians better manage patients according to evidence, healthcare teams, better coordinate proactive care, and to help patients better self-manage their conditions. He is particularly interested in how IT can be used to support individual behavior change. Since February 2011, when IBM's Watson computer was first showcased competing on Jeopardy, Jeff has been leading IBM's Canadian activities into adapting this deep question answering technology to the domain of decision support for physicians. Good morning, everybody. As uh, Paul mentioned, I'm from British Columbia. I hope you won't hold that against me. And as part of this uh, uh, proceeding, I guess, I want to put my remarks into context. If this is a big data and analytics core uh, um, event, uh, it's important to clarify what kind of big data, what kind of analytics I'm going to be talking about. IBM kind of divides that world into two. and. Uh, on the left here, we have knowledge-driven analytics, which is what Watson is, where we already have a, bu a body of published knowledge, body of evidence in healthcare context. Uh, the other kind is data-driven, and uh, uh, where you're using observational data and you're trying to extrapolate from that. And uh, we know what a black art some of that predictive analytics is from yesterday's uh, election in British Columbia. I don't know if you followed any of the polls. No one was predicting what happened. Uh, British Columbians continue to confound the pollsters, and obviously there's a lot of work that has to go into those predictive analytics algorithms for the next election. So I'm going to be talking about IBM's Watson technology. Uh, you may have uh, heard about it a couple years ago when uh, IBM took on the grand challenge of uh, teaching a computer to play Jeopardy. And uh, why would a $100 billion company invest in game playing technology? Well, it's because Jeopardy represents a grand challenge in the domain of artificial intelligence and specifically in the subdomain of deep question answering within artificial intelligence. Uh, because uh, the nature of uh, Jeopardy, this game show where the answer is the question or the question is the answer, and uh, the texture of uh, the game is all about innuendo and uh, nuances of language, punning, uh, the wordplay. It's a very complex linguistic problem. And so if you can get a computer to actually uh, perform against uh, the rules of Jeopardy, then you've got something uh, that could be quite useful for many other domains. And so uh, because we were successful in adapting uh, this technology for deep question answering in Jeopardy. We're now busy working on adapting it to a couple of other key industry domains. Uh, we're working in the financial sector uh, with uh, large banks using it as a, an assistant for customer support. Uh, we have a secret contract with the US government that I can't talk about. And we also have uh, the key area that I focus on is adapting it for clinical decision support in healthcare. How can we use this technology to help physicians uh, deliver better care by giving them all the evidence all the time at the point of care? So uh, again, just to, just to dwell for a moment on the complexity of the natural language problem that Watson solves, uh, when you look at natural language, it is ambiguous, uh, tacit, contextual. And here on the left, the, uh, the three Watsons. Uh, the first one, the man, the founder of IBM. The second, uh, location in IBM's uh, New York Research Center. And the third is the Watson computer. Which Watson are we talking about? Only context uh, can clarify that. Uh, in the middle, uh, John Lothgow there showing us his belt and his suspenders. In English, belt and suspenders implies 
uh, someone who is prudent, someone who is, uh, has a backup plan, someone that's uh, uh, ready for contingencies. But at, at the same time, you, you can also use it pejoratively. Say, this guy's really risk averse, right? He's, he's spending too much time worrying about things that aren't going to happen. And then uh, over on the right, there's Groucho Marx, where even word order can affect the meaning, right? This morning I shot an elephant in my pajamas. Uh, so th the problem of natural language, being able to compute over this very complex, ambiguous space is a huge accomplishment, and that's one of the key accomplishments of IBM's Watson technology. Uh, many people, because we've been living in this world of search since when, 94 or 96, when did AltaVista start? Many of you aren't old enough to remember that, but I am. Uh, we take search for granted now. It is part of the fabric of our life. Uh, and some people think Watson is just search on steroids. But it, it uses search, but it's not the main focus of how it works. Because uh, search uh, requires the searcher to do all the work. You have to come up with a question, and then you have to distill it into keywords. Uh, and then you can send your keywords out to uh, Google or Bing or whoever you're using, and they might bring you back two million hits. And then you have to sort through those for relevance. You have to decide if the keywords were actually working. Uh, whereas Watson is a true expert system from the point of view of uh, supporting experts in their work because it allows them to ask a natural language question. It understands the question, it parses the syntax of the question and actually knows what you're asking. And then uh, goes out and produces, uh, makes hypotheses about how, you could, how it might answer this, these questions and uh, finds evidence to support those hypotheses and then comes back and, and, and shows you the one that it believes is or, or ranks them in its order of confidence. So uh, it is a truly a different kind of um, uh, agent than a mere search engine. So th this is uh, as technical as I get in my work. I, you may have picked up. I'm not on the technical side of IBM. Uh, but this is, uh, if, if Watson's accomplishment uh, is really a software accomplishment, although for Jeopardy we used it uh, on very large hardware, that was only to get the throughput to answer questions within three seconds, or one and a half seconds is really what we had to compute. Uh, but it'll run on much smaller computers if, if you have more time. Uh, but Watson represents well over 100 different algorithms that are uh, held in a, in a framework and then tuned to, to work together. And uh, so the process that it goes through is uh, breaking down the question and then looking at a corpus of evidence for uh, generating hypotheses of potential answers and then looking for evidence of those answers in the corpus of evidence and then coming back and giving you its answer with a confidence ranking uh, that it produces stochastically. Uh, so, and, it, and for, uh, for Jeopardy, it did all that in one and a half seconds, three seconds. So working over 200 million pages, that was the corpus of uh, text that, uh, uh, that Watson was using for Jeopardy. So the question is, how would you adapt that game playing technology to be useful in the real world? And in healthcare, uh, it has a lot of potential. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the quiz chart. If you take anything away from uh, my little talk this morning, it's these three points. Watson is unique because it does these three things. First of all, it understands natural language. We've already talked about that. The, the ability to compute over and reason over English. Uh, secondly, it generates and evaluates hypotheses, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And the third thing I really haven't mentioned is that it learns and adapts, that it, it uses machine learning algorithms to get better and better and better at the domain question answering that you're training it on. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment as well. So when we look at the problems that physicians face in healthcare and what health administrators face in healthcare, uh, we're really looking at a sea of unstructured data. Although we're investing millions of dollars in uh, clinical information systems that have relational databases associated with them, those are systems of record, there's a massive amount of clinical fact that's created in the form of free text, in the form of consultants notes, uh, um, uh, radiology reports, pathology reports, 
Uh, much of the facts about a patient's case and the details of those are recorded in text. And those documents are lying around, and floating around, being kept, or, kept around inside the healthcare system in, in a way that's really not linked with the structured data in relational databases. So this is a wealth of knowledge that Watson tries to, uh, tries to attack. Uh, it's relevant knowledge for healthcare uh, and it's uh, textual. Uh, the other knowledge that Watson looks at is the knowledge that's been published. All of the articles that have been published in medical journals for the last 10 years. Uh, and you have to understand the, uh, the task that physicians are faced with today because uh, there were about a million articles abstracted in PubMed last year. Uh, 800,000 in the National Institute of Health uh, uh, Journal Index. And so that means that it's physically impossible for physicians uh, who have studied for seven or 10 or 12 years to keep current in their domain because their domain, the velocity of knowledge is changing so quickly there. Uh, we know that the uh, average physician reads about five journal articles a month. And uh, uh, when there's thousands and thousands of journal articles in your domain speciality being published each month, there's no way for you to know all the new evidence uh, and so uh, this is the potential that Watson holds, the ability to read this evidence on behalf of the physician and to be there at the point of care and help the physician use it. And you know, from the surveys that I've done both in Calgary and Edmonton, uh, nobody is really, really wants their physician to be without the latest evidence. We expect our physicians to uh, have uh, all the knowledge that they need to treat us. And so, uh, this is a logical tool for physicians to use. So here's an example of how Watson looks at uh, medical literature. This, uh, an extraction from the, uh, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, I believe. Uh, they publish uh, uh, complex cases every month called Stalking the Diagnosis. Uh, anyways, uh, we fed these kinds of articles into Watson and you can watch it parse uh, these articles and look for uh, the category of facts that we'd, we would call symptoms, that we would call diseases, that we would call medications, and then modifiers, whether there's no pain or whether it's on the left side. Uh, Watson has the ability to extract and structure facts from this unstructured text that are uh, useful in the diagnosis and the treatment processes that physicians go through. And the, the diagnosis and treatment processes that physicians go through are similar in structure to how Watson works. Physicians do generate hypotheses and they do look for evidence to support those hypotheses. Uh, it's common that physicians will have three or four potential uh, diagnoses in their mind while they're working uh, through a problematic diagnostic case and they'll be looking to match evidence, facts from labs, from family history, symptoms, uh, to those diagnoses to see if they fit. So uh, there is congruency in the way that the, the uh, processes, the cognitive processes that physicians use and the way that Watson is architected. And the cognitive processes that physicians use are their strengths and their weaknesses. They're, uh, they're faced with the same wetware limitations that the rest of us are in the sense that um, their brains work as excellent pattern recognizers, but they're really, we're really not organized to look at tens of thousands of articles in detail and to keep all of those facts in our head at the moment. Uh, because we're pattern recognizers, we're susceptible to errors in decision making, uh, cognitive biases, which is the root cause for all of the key problems uh, in diagnosis, but also in other industries, the operation of nuclear power plants, the uh, piloting of aircraft. Uh, when you look at uh, adverse events that happen in those industries and you analyze root cause, cognitive bias or cognitive dispositions are always at the root. And uh, so Watson provides the physician with a way through these kinds of framing problems that we all use as a way to save time, but they can lead to the wrong conclusions. Watson uh, allows, barks up every tree, I guess, is the way to think about Watson, uh, looking at every article and evaluating every piece of evidence that the physician can't. Uh, so I mentioned that Watson's a learning technology. This is the learning curve for how we trained it to play Jeopardy. And the bottom lines were some of the initial work that we did and as we got better and added algorithms and tweaked algorithms, you could see that the performance of Watts and the lines moving up started to come into the cluster of dots which represent the performance of the two world champions 
in Jeopardy. So the, the cluster of dots is the human performance and the lines of machine performance. And over time, we were able to train Watson, obviously, to be competitive uh, there. And we are doing the exact same thing in healthcare. Uh, there's the uh, American College of Physicians publishes every month something called Doctor's Dilemma, which is kind of like Doctor's Jeopardy. It's a test uh, for them to pit their uh, diagnostic uh, skills against. And so we're obviously using that as a training corpus for uh, Watson, and uh, you can see Watson's performance on diagnosis is going up after a number of series of trainings and starting, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> starting to move into the realm of a uh, seasoned clinician in its accuracy of its diagnosis and treatment recommendations. So uh, it's good for healthcare because it understands natural language. You can say, what condition has red eyes, pain, inflammation, blurred vision, floating spots, and sensitivity to light? Who would want that? Anyways, Watson can figure out what that is. It understands that that uh, probably would be a diagnosis. It's able to consume massive amounts of data. Uh, the corpus that it's being trained against is like the syllabus of the Harvard Medical School and then uh, all of the uh, uh, cases that Memorial Sloan Kettering has looked at for the last 10 years. Is that more data is better for this kind of process, for these stochastic processes. Uh, it's able to generate hypotheses and search for the evidence that supports those hypotheses. It shows can, the physician can always see the evidence. It's not making recommendations that are blinded to the physician. It is delivering the evidence at a click. The physician can go and look. I'll show you how that works in a second. Um, and it supports iterative dialogue. Watson uh, knows what it knows, but it also knows what it doesn't know. Uh, if it believes that you're missing a critical diagnostic test, then it will prompt the physician for that. Is it possible that you could get this fact from the lab? And then my confidence in our recommendations would go up if I had that fact. So it has the ability to uh, have dialogue with a physician. And then, I, again, I mentioned the, the learning capability, the fact that it's trainable and it improves at what it does over time. So uh, here's a little illustration of Watson as a diagnostic support tool. And looking at the various facts that a physician would uh, glean from uh, examining a patient, uh, looking at their symptoms, uh, you can see this uh, difficulty swallowing fever. And then Watson is building a diagnostic model and already starting to speculate on what could be the root cause of this disease and already ranking its confidence in, in, uh, in the, its prediction. As it gathers more information, uh, here's some uh, discretionary uh, symptoms that he does not have abdominal pain. There's no back pain. Those are facts that are as important as positive symptoms, right? Negative symptoms and positive symptoms uh, equally important in diagnosis. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side that the confidence bars are moving as we move through family history and gather more facts from the patient history. Uh, medications that they're on and finally uh, their lab results, the findings uh, and uh, so Watson is computing uh, its confidence in the diagnosis and comes up with UTI against this. So that's a quick illustration of uh, how it might work as a decision support tool. Uh, let's talk about how it works as a treatment clinical decision support tool as well. Uh, we've been working with Memorial Sloan Kettering, a uh, large and notable oncology specialty organization in New York City. Uh, for the last year and a half or two years uh, to using their expertise, their oncologists, and, and combining with our computer scientists and our own medical informatics specialists uh, to adapt Watson for diagnosis and treatment. And so we chose oncology uh, very specifically. It's a key domain in healthcare where all the numbers are going the wrong way because our populations are aging, the incidence of cancer is increasing. Uh, the cost of treating individual cancers is, is increasing faster than any other kinds of disease. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why oncology, and, and from a practical point of view, it's a narrower domain than general practice. Uh, general practice is a much more complex uh, uh, question answering a domain problem than oncology. So we can bound the domain by focusing on oncology and there's need in the marketplace for uh, the complexities of the decisions that oncologists make are as complex as any physician, so they could use expert systems. 
So we're working on three different therapies. The one I'm going to uh, show you today is the one on the left, the Diagnosis and Treatment Advisor. That is what we're doing with Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, we have another uh, project in the States at MD Anderson around uh, uh, clinical research. And the, the third one, Dynamic Case Advisor, is, is kind of a, a patient summary of most current relevant facts about the patient that we think all physicians will be interested in. Uh, but looking at the, uh, the first one, the diagnosis and treatment of oncology, uh, here, here's the facts that, oh, look at that, I'm almost ready to end. Um, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, sees the, the, the key issues the same way as IBM does in this market, and so that's why we focused on it. Uh, just to give you a quick illustration before I close, I'm going to show you a couple of uh, slides from the actual application that we're working on, how Watson might be integrated into the clinical care processes that physicians use. And, you know, the history of clinical decision support is littered uh, with failures of uh, applications that physicians did not take up. And why is that? It's because we tried to force physicians to change their clinical workflow, to do things in a way that they don't want to do. To, usually to do it in a way that costs them time. If it costs them 30 seconds, they won't do it. So you have to integrate this tool into the clinical workflow processes that physicians are comfortable with. And here you can see it baked into the patient electronic medical record, the interface that physicians are already using uh, to treat patients. And you see an Ask Watson button down on the upper lower left corner. And Watson will uh, take the information from your EMR and then go out and compare it to guidelines and textbooks and journal articles and uh, drug documents and other clinical documents like clinical guidelines for oncology uh, very quickly and develop a summary of its uh, perspective on this patient. And uh, then down on the lower left, you can see that there's uh, uh, case information, test options, and treatment options. Anyways, this uh, unfortunate woman, a young woman, non-smoker, has been diagnosed with lung cancer. And so uh, uh, Watson uh, starts to look at uh, potential treatment options for this patient and sees that there's missing information, prompts the physician for uh, an MRI and prompts the physician for a, uh, a, a gene mutation test uh, that would all be relevant. Uh, up in the uh, upper right-hand corner, you see this button uh, about evidence for the test that it's suggesting. And so if the physician questions, for whatever reason, why Watson would be recommending that, the physician can drill in and go look at the, the, not only the abstract of the article, but down into the very article itself that Watson is using as, uh, as its reference for why this evidence is relevant to the case. So uh, the physician never has to take anything on trust from Watson. Watson is just reading. You know, it's like having an assistant that reads every article and uh, providing the physician with quick access to that. Um, so uh, we get these facts back from the tests, and uh, then the Watson is actually starting to recommend treatment plans that can actually accommodate patient preference. Patient preference is something that historically has been kind of a secondary consideration, but changes in the way physicians are practicing. Now um, uh, the patient uh, might be uh, less interested in losing their hair, and might be less interested in, in the nausea that goes with some of the oncology treatments. So is there, that might be some of the preferences that could be considered when we're weighing what treatment is the right one. Um, so I'm gonna run out of time here, so uh, what I'll do is just leap through and, and close on uh, uh, some ideas about how Watson might be used elsewhere in healthcare. Um, we're working currently now around differential diagnosis and treatments, supporting the core of what physicians do, but there's many, many other use cases uh, that we see Watson as being relevant for, and we're busy working with medical organizations uh, in North America to try and test some of these new use cases. You can see the potential from using it uh, with uh, um, uh, paramedical people or um, uh, nurses in remote areas, providing them with the diagnostic tools of a specialty center uh, when they're a long way from the specialist. You can see all sorts of telemedicine uh, opportunities there. Uh, many research areas looking at uh, molecular facts about individuals, the type of driver mutations in their tumors and comparing those to the evidence and tailoring treatments specific to that kind of molecular. Uh, profile of those patients. So um, we're busy working on uh, many of these new use cases as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. 
And again, here is the quiz. If, uh, if you get anything out of uh, today's talk about Watson, it does these three things that are novel, natural language, the hypothesis generation and the confidence weighting and the learning. So uh, there's, uh, just to close here, uh, how many of you remember the first cell phone that you ever saw? There. I do, it was, uh, it was a box that, that had a handle on it that looked like what, like a radio phone, it was a radio phone. And, and uh, very specialized real estate agents, I think, were the first people to use them in Victoria. But eventually, uh, they started to get smaller and more people started to use them and they got less expensive. And, and now, you know, here, here we are in this world where we all have these powerful computers in our pocket. Um, and pretty soon they'll be embedded behind our ear. And, 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 uh, uh, but my point is, uh, I believe that we're looking at the first cell phone in this new domain called cognitive computing, uh, where computers interact with us the way we want to interact instead of us having to talk to them through control, alt, delete, and all these other unnatural acts that we have all been. Uh, performing uh, in the history of computing uh, through natural language processing and, and uh, machine learning, they'll start to become useful to us <clears throat> in ways that we cannot anticipate now. So, thank you for your attention. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today, and I'll be available for questions later. Thank you. Join the conversation next year as more cities become data-driven, become a community partner. Contact us at info at abctech.ca.